I'm Dano Davis and uh, I'm the nut behind the wheel that had the idea to develop uh, this building and our collection, the Brumos collection. I've always been a car nut. My dad never understood me uh, because I was mechanical and he wasn't. And uh, my mom's dad actually was a carpenter and I think I got most of my teaching from him probably working with him in the summers. But this collection to me is uh, it's special because it's so diverse and yet it has the common thread through it of, of racing and car development. And I, I kind of like to think it's almost the history of the uh, internal combustion engine, starting with our 1894 Peugeot and all the way up to our last car, which is the 2017 uh, Porsche RSR. Our L45 in the collection here is a significant car to me for what it really is and when it was developed. I've always been impressed with the way these cars were developed in the early age of automobiles to go racing. The personalities, the people involved with them was always very interesting to me, so I'm kind of a romantic at heart, believe it or not. When this car became available, I didn't know what I was going to do, but I wanted to try and get it and because it was so significant to, to racing, it was so significant as one of the absolute forerunners. It was a, a good example of uh, the French engineering at the time. In the early 20th century, France was really the industrial leader in automobiles. They had the plants, they had the equipment, they had the engineers. They had more serious manufacturers than the rest of the world combined. The uh, Charlatans were a group of three drivers that had a lot of experience in racing, had been very successful, and they each had ideas developed through their racing experience of what they thought would improve cars, in particular the cars that they were racing, which were the Peugeots at the time. So they got together, they went to see Robert Peugeot to ask for financing and a place that they could do their engineering and development work for the race cars. They were given the financing and they were given the space, which was away from the other engineering groups, which caused a concern, I guess you would say, with the old timers, and uh, they nicknamed them the Charlatans. Along with Ernst Henry, their engineer slash draftsman, they developed the changes over a period of about three and a half years, really starting in 1911. Then with the 1914 Peugeot L45, it all came together in one package. Our car here in the collection is one of the series. The first was the 7.6 liter, then the 5.6 liter, then this being the L45, it was a four and a half and then there was a three liter later. As the rules changed in racing, they required them to reduce the maximum cubic inches of the engine. So that's why they started out larger and ended smaller. The uh, dual overhead cam shaft started in, as I said earlier in the 1911 with the, the L76 or 7.6. It was a completely new idea that was more efficient, allowed better breathing and so forth for the engines and continued to be developed and used by other manufacturers as well. Some of the other things that they did on these cars was uh, very interesting to me was they, they did a subframe assembly for the engine which allowed the engine to be lower in the car for better handling. They did the dry sump oil system, which was not new, but this may have been one of the first times it was really used uh, in racing. And up until this time, basically the race cars only had rear wheel brakes. This car has all wheel brakes. They also used semi-elliptical uh, springs in the car. This car is rather unique. It was one of the four cars that uh, the French Grand Prix in 1914. If you see photos, it is the car on the far right, which has smaller louvers than the other three cars. So we know which car is which, and this is the small louver car. We also have come to believe that this was the test car in late 13 uh, to learn about the cars, how they handled. Of course, back in that day, they, they did testing on the track instead of in 
in buildings with computers and so forth. So it was on the real racetracks, or at that time, really, they were roads, and uh, they learned through experience. We feel that this car is really one of the premier cars in our collection. It represents the early engineering, early development, the early ideas in racing that became to be commonplace today. Some people call this the great grandfather of the modern day race car, and I guess it is in some ways, but rather crude in terms of what we have today. I've always been impressed with what these men were able to do with their hands and their minds. They didn't have computers, they didn't have all the, the machinery, milling machines and so forth we have now. Handmade, uh, use their brains and build amazing machines that really excited the world. In 1913, Peugeot sent two cars over to race at Indianapolis. Jules Gu was one of those two drivers and he actually won the race that year. First time a non-American had won the race. He, he sold his car to an American racer named Bob Berman and Bob raced it around the U.S. And, was reasonably successful and he, he blew the engine in the car and he needed someone to fix it. He had heard about Harry Miller in LA and he took it to Harry and asked them if he and uh, Fred Offenhauser, who was Miller's shop foreman, if they could repair the engine. And I think carefully they didn't show their excitement but they had known that the Peugeots were far advanced so they had an opportunity to take a look and they repaired his engine. That was the kind of the, the hook that got Miller into the engine building business. They learned an awful lot. And of course, as you know, between Miller and Offenhauser, who basically bought the engine works from of Miller when he went broke <laughs> the second time, uh, that was an engine that led racing for 50 years. Harry Miller was a, a a rather unusual guy, but he was a visionary and he had a lot of great ideas. He was fortunate enough to attract Fred Offenhauser to work with him in his shop. He actually started out making carburetors originally and then moved into making racing parts. And then in uh, 1919, Leo Goosen came to work. So it's a, it's a very interesting combination of three guys brought something to the party, so to speak. Uh, Miller was the guy that had ideas, he had the vision. Uh, Fred was the guy that could make it happen, build it. Leo was the guy that could draw it and design it. So it was uh, very successful for, uh, for many years, but Harry liked to spend money. He didn't, <laughs> I don't think he charged enough for his cars when he started building cars. And he actually went broke two times. <laughs> the last time was permanent. <laughs> so there's a lot of little interwoven stories with these cars that we have on the forerunner side of the collection but they kind of are all here for a reason each is significant for some reason and all have a relationship to racing uh, they all are not race cars but they have a relationship to either racing or the people that were involved in developing racing